I'd like to call this meeting to order. And so we'll take a roll call to make sure everybody's registered in. Uh, is that your camera? Sure. Tony Allegretti. Present. Ricardo Diaz. Here. Scott Dossett. Here. Katrina Kendall. Here. And Daryl Price. Here. Excellent. We have our crew. Um, let's approve the agenda. I'll take a motion for that and then we'll come to um, their other order of business. Uh, Scott, since you're on the phone, you probably don't have the same access. We'll just have a, uh, the regular item three new business, which will be the training and then Q&A for us, uh, then public participation. Uh, Mike won't be taking questions from the public, just from us. Uh, so he'll step out and then we'll have public participation and then an adjournment. Um, a motion to approve this agenda, please. I've, I've moved that we approve the agenda for today. Thank you, Daryl. A second? Second. Second from Scott. All those in favor? Oh, I think we need to do a roll call. Darn it. All right, come on. Tony Allegretti? Yes, I approve. Ricardo Diaz? Agree. Scott Dossett? Yes. Katrina Kendall? Agree. Daryl Price? Yes. Thank you. So we can move on to the rest. Um, I don't see uh, any public here. Uh, we are recording it. We're going to need this. Oh, I do see 15 participants, participants now. Uh, yes, seven other people. Thank you, uh, everyone. I see you. I see your names. Uh, we'll come back to you. Um, so before we move on to the training, uh, Mike, I just want to uh, just put before you because it, 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 it's been simmering in my mind, uh, besides uh, Mikhail uh, um, uh, resigning in, at our last meeting, we've also had Megan also resign in the last few days. Uh, she's a teacher and I don't have to tell you how difficult their job is right now. And so she decided to step back, which means we have two openings. Uh, and so we need to start recruiting people to to do uh, to put their name in uh, and come back to them. Uh, I don't want to say anything more because I am uh, just so caught up with that, overwhelmed with with the fact. Uh, but uh, here I am. I I've always thought that this was like a, a, a something on the side, and now it's becoming front and center for me. So I hope that as we work together we can make it better and as we bring on new people we can we can do our job during these times so uh without any further introduction we uh we've met you dr schlosser and we know we you have good content in this case on a different subject um and we're happy to have you um and uh have a discussion as we go so um uh, I won't introduce you anymore. Maybe you should say, do you want questions through? And that way there won't be a, a drag towards the end. Whichever way you, you like is good for me. Uh, if you guys want to ask questions throughout, that's fine. If you want to wait till the end, it's, it's, uh, it's your cookout. I'm just here for the barbecue. All right. Well, uh, take the first hot dog then. Go ahead. All right, let's get started. First, thank, I want to thank you for inviting me back. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a topic along with use of force that is very um, important to me. Um, I do travel around and teach this non-escalation and de-escalation training all over the state in the Midwest. I do, uh, I've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, I think it's, it's critical and I, I think it's even really becoming more critical today. More critical to answers. But I also um, have been training um, non-police um, for different groups. Like I train most of the departments on campus and, and just other you know, businesses, companies, because it can apply to everybody. So this, 
So what I'm going to do to tonight is, and of course, keep in mind, this is a kind of a shortened version of it because the recruits get eight hours of it. And then we have 80 hours of scenario based training and they get to practice it throughout the 14 weeks. So this will be just kind of a, a mini version of, of, and I will, I will make it applicable at times to police, but also to the, the civilian world. So I will get started if I can, I'm not very technologically advanced, but I'm going to try to share my screen. Wish me luck. With you. Let's see. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, good, I feel better already. All right, so what we're gonna go over tonight is de-escalation training, but I, I like calling it also non-escalation training because how we talk to somebody to begin with can prevent things from escalating. So these will be tactics and, and if you don't remember anything else from this kind of shortened version and not getting repeated scenario-based training, the, the two primary things I'd really like you to focus on and get out of this are the thing that we call the five step and empathy slash deflection phrases. And if you can grasp that, those two concepts, then I think it would help everybody who is in a situation where they feel like they need to, to deescalate or they want to prevent things from escalating. So, and in fact, I'm going to start first here with uh, my, my mentor sent in the late 1980s, he was my first instructor and um, you know, he was, was my mentor. He passed away a few years ago, but this is Dr. George Thompson. He was a professor turned cop and he studied cops for years and he came up with something called verbal judo. And how he did that was he could see in the real world, what is it that these cops are doing where they get things, people to comply and things don't escalate most of the time. We know that words don't always work, right? However, that's, that was what he was observing. And then he was observing some of, the, some of the cops that were like, why is it that these guys seem to escalate things a little bit more? And so he created a program that he, does not, that he did not credit to himself, but credited to the officers that he studied. So I just like to give a shout out to my, uh, to my mentor. All right, I think I said this was important, didn't I? Five step? All right, so we're gonna go over the five step. And a lot of this is common sense. A lot of the things that I'm gonna tell you, it's, it's like, you'll say, well, yeah, that makes sense, I get it. But sometimes under stress, without practice, sometimes under stress, it's hard to you know, facilitate the five step or the empathy phrases and things like that. Um, but so the first step is if I want somebody to do something, Okay, no matter what it is, I am going to ask that person because people would rather be asked than told to do something. That just makes sense. But we have to remember that as soon as you ask somebody to do something, they're thinking, well, why do I need to do this? And so, you know, we train our officers and I, and I, I train civilians that if you want somebody to do something, ask them, but then explain why. Take the time to explain things to people. You don't have to get in a hurry. But if you can set context and explain things, and the more you can make it sound like not that big of a deal and kind of minimize it, the more likely you're gonna get people to comply with you. Now, that may not work. We may have to move into the next step. And that next step is presenting options. So if I want somebody to do something, I ask them and I'd explain it to them and they don't wanna do it, well, they need to know what their options are. So. I need to make that option, even if they don't want to do it, a good option, especially relative to what would, would happen or could happen if they don't comply with that option. So I'm going to explain to them, you know, right now, this is all we have. This is what we need to do to take care of it. Unfortunately, if, you know, if, if you're not going to do that or you're not going to comply, this is what's going to happen. I don't want that to happen for you. We are always on their side. We are always showing that empathy. We want to understand and, and we want to help them. So it's like right now, hey, this is all we've got. Let's get this taken care of because we don't want this to happen to you. You know, let's just say, you know, this is what we've got. So, you know, so you kind of go like good option, bad option, back to the good option. And then most of the time you will get compliance at that point. And I, and I think that uh, 
you know, there's, there's not a national database, but if you look at the different studies, you will find that out of all arrests, somewhere between 80 and 88% of all arrests, people do comply. Um, and of course, we know that's not going to make the news, you know, two officers go into a violent domestic or a disturbance and the person complies with the arrest. But that's what happens most of the time. But if, if you're still not getting compliance, we want to give somebody a second chance. We, we want to maybe explain things a little bit further and explain what's going on and why we need to do it. And then have some sort of phrase like, you know, sir or ma'am, is there anything I can say, you know, to gain your cooperation? You know, I'd really like to be able to help you. I'd like to think so. So then you still may not get compliance and things can escalate from there. And then, then you know, it could be a situation where for a police officer, that means make an arrest or that means call for backup or that means disengaging could mean a number of things. For civilians, it might be, depending on how escalated it is or isn't, you might just get help from a coworker, call a coworker, maybe that person will have some luck talking to, to, to the person that you're trying to get to comply with something. You know, it, it may get kind of scary. It may get to the point where you think this is getting out of hand and you just need to disengage. It's okay to t remove yourself from something where you think you're gonna be unsafe. Worst case scenario, protect yourself. I mean, hopefully, you know, I, I don't know what jobs everybody else has here, but if you, you know, if you, if somebody attacks you, you have the right to protect yourself. You have the right to fight back. And, you know, that we don't want that to happen, but that could happen. And then, you know, it might mean that you're calling for a supervisor, you're getting security, you're calling the police. And so these are the steps that we want to take. And most people will comply within these steps. But a lot of times I've talked to different uh, companies and different departments uh, here on campus. And if I'm working with somebody and somebody is, is getting unruly almost to the point of disorderly conduct and I need to get help, I want them to go either get security or call the police or something like that, then you usually have a code word because I'm not gonna say in front of the person who's escalating to my um, coworker, hey, go call the police. You know, that's only gonna escalate things more. So I, we would have a code word. There's several departments that here at the university that the code word is, you know, um, can, you, can you go get the red folder? And that means go call the police or whatever they've set up. Um, of course, if you work somewhere where they have a red folder and they come back with the red folder, don't use that one. That one wouldn't be good. But, uh, you know, I, I had another group that said, well, we say get the CTP folder. And can any of you figure out what that might mean? Get the CTP folder. Call the police. Who said that? I did. Call Daryl. Call, call the police. <laughs> uh, you, you, you get an A today. There's my first A student. Nice job. Thank you. So, all right. So I, I gave a, I think a little sample of this, example of this. Uh, last time I talked to you guys, and it's the easiest one to use via Zoom. So I'd like to put this in a police context and use that same scenario. I think, I I think it's the same one I used last time. And because I've been teaching this all over the place to, well, 300 uh, wellness support associates here lately. But um, so if I could get a volunteer to be my role player and don't everybody volunteer at once. I know how that is. Everybody always says, pick me. Okay. Well, not really. But if I could get a volunteer that I made a traffic stop on and here's your role playing lines, here's the lines. No matter what I say, you say no. And that's all there is to it. I can hold up cue cards if you want, but that's, that's it. So if I could get somebody to be a person that I stopped on a vehicle stop and there's a warrant for their arrest and we'll go through the five step and show how that works in a situation like that. Hey, not everybody wants settle down people. I'll, I'll go first and that way that'll get me out of the way. Katrina actually was gonna, actually she said yes. She beat okay. me. All right, let's, who, who do I have? Cause I don't see all the people here, Katrina. Can you hear me? Hey, there you are, Katrina. Yes, I can. <laughs> now I can see you too. All right, so you are my person I have a warrant for, okay? Hmm. And okay. I, made traffic, I made a traffic stop and I ran you my little computer and I found out that you failed to appear in court on a traffic ticket. And I'm sure you've never had any, but that's being said, <laughs> we're pretending. So, uh, we, so I made this traffic stop, I ran you, and I found out there's a warrant for your arrest and you're sitting in your vehicle. And of course, before I place you under arrest, which I'm obligated to do, I, I need to have you step out of the vehicle 
because when I place somebody under arrest, it's policy to place handcuffs on somebody. So when I come up to your vehicle and, and explain to you to, to step out of the car, I'm also going to explain why. And when I explain why, you know, we teach our recruit officers just to be honest, just tell the truth. But I can also minimize things. I can, I can make things sound not maybe as bad as they are. Mike, you're prepping her too much. You shouldn't know what's in your mind. She's just getting pulled over and her heart's palpitating. Okay, all right. So you just got pulled over and we'll go from there. You ready? Okay. All right, um, ma'am, I'm going to ask you to step out of the car and here's why. Um, I, I ran your name in, in the computer and apparently um, that you forgot to go to court on a traffic ticket. And that happens. I know that happens. It's happened to my son before. And, but what, unfortunately what they do is they do issue, you know, it's a minor warrant, but they do issue a warrant for your arrest. And the bond that you would have to come up with is uh, $250. And then uh, we can get that taken care of and, and get you on, on your way. But, uh, you know, I know these things happen and, you know, apparently you did forget to go to court. It happens. So would you please step out of the car? No. Good. Well, that's great acting. Nice job. <laughs> All right. I'm, I guess I'll have to present you some options. All right. So ma'am, right now, um, all we have, it's a, it's a very minor warrant for forgetting to go to court. Um, but unfortunately, and I don't want this for you because I'm sure you have things you need to do tonight and we can get this done quickly if, you know, if we get this taken care of. But unfortunately, <clears throat> if you don't step out of the vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I don't have COVID. I just got to stop smoking marijuana. I'm kidding, kidding, as far as you guys know. All right, so I got Katrina laughing now. All right, so um, so right now it's just, a, it's a minor warrant. We can get this taken care of. We can get you on your way. Unfortunately, if you don't step out of the vehicle and you would have to be forced out of the vehicle, which I absolutely don't want to do, you would have additional charges. You know, that could be resisting or resisting arrest. Um, the bond would be, be higher. I don't know if you'd have to stay, you know, overnight in jail. I, I definitely don't want that for you. But um, right now, all we've got is a very minor warrant. I'd like to get it taken care of. You can even pay with your credit card or whatever. And then we can get you on your way and we can get this taken care of and get this all off your record. So, um, ma'am, would you please step out of the car? No. Okay. All right. You know, I, I really want to help you on this and I don't want things to get worse. So, you know, is, is there anything I can say or any questions I can answer that maybe you don't understand that, that I can, you know, get you to comply and step out of the vehicle? No. Okay. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to call for backup. And when my backup, while my backup's en route, I'm going to keep talking to you. Maybe that second officer at the scene ha can somehow have a better rapport. So they might start talking to you just like the coworker might. Um, but if we don't get our results, then we are going to have to, you know, forcefully make an arrest. So does that kind of put it in context for everybody of how, this, this works and how this works in other situations too. So I kind of wanted to put it in a police context initially. So, um, but what, so sorry to interrupt. So what do you do if when this de-escalation happened and the officers are trained to go through these five steps, what, what if I don't speak English? What if I speak a total different thing and all I know is the word no, if I've been taught that, yeah. Your officers are going through these steps quickly and I have no idea what you're saying. And all I'm used to saying is no for everything. Sure. But sure. now you've escalated it and I don't know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And if I can realize that somebody doesn't speak English and which mm -hmm. was very possible um, and then I'm going to get a translator. And luckily here, with especially with like the university and Champaign County so di diverse we have you know we have translators for you know many languages since I'm limited to uh, English and I don't do that great but <laughs> okay any questions about the five step before I move on so this is what we're trained locally are there other models or is there uh are there other ways of training de-escalation at the police a, level? I understand that on campus, you know, there's got to be a red folder or whatever, but this is, you know, as, as a police, uh, what they're trained and what they're supposed to do is, is our goal here. 
Yeah, so there's, there's other forms of de-escalation training, um, and it's becoming a big market now, as you can guess. And um, a lot of the de-escalation trainings that I've gone to, I try to go to as many as, as I can, they don't, a lot of them don't have concrete things, like what to say, what not to say, what steps to t say, to do. And even if, you, you, even if let's say, I, I don't have this memorized, I can realize that from this, I need to talk to people with respect and empathy. I need to ask people to do things like, I need to explain things. And if it's not exactly like this, but I'm taking my time to explain what's going on and, you know, and I know the consequences for them. If they don't, like, I'm going to explain that. So it's taking the time to explain the things that I know as a police officer while, while I'm th thinking all the time, I am on your side and I don't want these things to happen to you. So that's the overall concept of it. And then um, there's a lot of other conceptual de-escalation trainings, but to have de-escalation training where they have specific, um, you know, things that you can do and say and not say, um, it, it kind of varies. So. Are there, since we had the, the, other, the other training, which was use of force, um, you get to number five, you mentioned another officer might get better rapport, but they go through number five. Is that when use of force comes in? And, and what, and what de-escalation actions are there before you, before you get to forcibly removing or? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm gonna to continue to talk for a while. I'm not in a hurry, you know, and I may be by myself and I may not have backup. And after I say something like, you know, you know sir, is there anything I can say to gain your cooperation? I'd like to think so. They, it might, at that point, somebody might take off running, somebody might attack me, somebody might, you know, so if I can wait for backup, that's great. But um, at any time during the five step where I'm under attack or they're running from me or things like that, at any time, I have to skip straight to number five and act. I can't, you know, go through these steps in certain situations. If they're running from me, I'm not gonna sprint after them and sprint beside them and say, sir, I'm gonna ask you to stop running. And the reason is, is because I'm getting really tired. I have some options, you know, I mean, you know, I'm being a little facetious, but at the same time, you know, we have to realize that things can evolve quickly. And there's times where you have no choice but to go to, to step number five. And that's based on, you know, your training and experience. But um, I can't have somebody uh, attacking me and I can, you know, my, my words then would be, you know, you know, sir, stop resisting, stop fighting me, stop resisting, get your hands behind your back, you know, and things like that. So, um, so you mentioned there a few minutes ago, you have the right to fight back, but the person doesn't have the right to fight back. Because I also learned over the last couple of weeks that there is no lawful way to resist. Those were the words that really grabbed me. Well, I, I guess you're thinking about somebody resisting the police. Well, you know, we just had our friend here say no. And she doesn't look like she, you know. No, and, yeah. and, and there's and there's there's tactics to remove somebody from a vehicle that aren't super violent. Okay, there. I mean, you know, I guess an, another thing might be is to demonstrate all of our arrest and control tactics because there's some very low end, mild things that we can do in our physical skills without simply just you know, grabbing somebody and throwing them onto the ground. Um, and it all- so When we see that being done, we know that that's not good training. Well- They're not following training. Well, here, here's, the, here's the situation. If the person is resisting, depending on how much they're resisting and I can't control them and I can't control them standing, I would probably immediately take them to the ground so that I can control them. And that kind of gets back into the use of force thing that I was talking about last week. So if I have, you know, and, it, and it's never pretty when you're, you know, when somebody's resisting or fighting you and you do the best you can to get control of them and, and you know, you, you do not want them to, to get away from you. You want to get your arrest accomplished and there's a standing control tactics, there's takedowns, there's other things we have to do, but um, it's just, you know, I, I wish it was all pretty and like it was on TV where somebody simply does something and they take them to the ground and then they're able to get the cuffs on just like that. Um, but it's not always easy, no matter who you're arresting, if they truly don't want to be controlled. So you have to do what you have to do to control them. So I hear, I heard that a lot in the other one too, control. Um, I didn't pay my ticket. 
um, that's my crime. I didn't show up to court. I didn't pay my ticket. I didn't show up to court. And now I am heaved to the ground for not that? Necess not necessarily. But once you start resisting arrest, you have just committed a different crime. Not forgetting to, you know, take care of your ticket. Your new crime, your new crime is resisting arrest. And I'd like to be able to just um, get control of somebody and escort them out of the vehicle. And depending on on the totality of the circumstances and how much they're resisting and how much they're fighting, that determines um, the tactics that I need to do. So if somebody's, you know, if I'm starting to arrest somebody and, and it seems like a minor offense, the offense gets greater once I get punched in the face, then it, that's a felony and that's aggravated battery. And then it is a much more serious crime. Even though the initial arrest, a warrant that I'm obligated to make the arrest started out as just something minor, it can certainly build up to me getting punched in the face and, and then it's aggravated battery. And then I have to use more force so that, you know, cause I'm getting attacked. And so we have to think about it like that. It's just like, okay, this was a minor crime, but now somebody's <laughs> fighting me now. Now maybe there's a weapon involved. Now maybe there's, so, so we have to look at it. The crime can evolve. So, um, oh, sorry. Go, go, I, I just want to, Katrina, let me finish this one because it's, it's very interesting to me. Uh, there is no way to resist arrest for a person under that circumstance. Um, I would have to look at the statute. There used to be a statute, and I don't know that now, but um, you, you, cannot, you cannot resist even an unlawful arrest. You need to get. That's true. That's right. You need to get that taken care of through the courts. You cannot resist an arrest, even if it's an, an unlawful arrest. Even if there, th this says that, that there's a warrant for you and the warrant's already been taken care of and it's not out of the system yet, I'm still obligated to make that arrest. And so the person may know that they didn't commit this crime because they, they took care of it. Um, so even if it's an unlawful arrest, you still can't resist. So the best thing to do is to go along with it and then we can get back and figure things out and maybe sort things out at the station even. Mm -hmm. but, you know, if it, but people I think need to know that, 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 that any resistance at that point is, is, uh, is gonna escalate and give you a new crime, even if you've taken care of it before. If you've yes. taken care of the first two, now I resisted arrest and now I get arrested for resisting arrest. Yeah, and, and, I, and I've had those situations before because um, Katrina might have said, no, you know, I already took care of that. I just took care of that yesterday. And I, and I would say, you know, I believe that maybe you did. You know, I, I believe you, Katrina, but um, right now it shows that you have that warrant. I, you know, I'd like to go for it, but as my job, when it says there's a warrant, I have to take care of it. But we could go get this sorted out. I wanted to clarify that. Sorry, Katrina, I interrupted you. That's okay. I have two questions. Your one just came out of that. So had you had stopped me and your warrant or my warrant is still in your system, but then I produce all the papers that I got from the court when you stop me, are you still gonna arrest me? Do if you I still can, have to take me to the station? If I can determine that that takes care of it, then mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I, you know, I would have to make sure that that matches up with what the warrant's for and mm -hmm. the truly is for that case. And then, no, I don't. And I, I can, you know, and if it ends up where you fooled me, I could find you later, I suppose, right? I mean, you know. Okay. It's a minor. Other, you're not, you're not going to leave the country for it. <laughs> right. My other question is, um, when you are teaching um, the police officers or the, the question at hand, even though these are wonderful and a lot of times, sometimes it's almost like a recipe where you have steps, but you've done it so many times, sometimes you skip a step. Do you have statistics where you might have an officer go from one to five and skip the steps in between? I would, the only time they would skip the steps would be if something happens, if there's some sort of um, danger for the officer or, or you know, there, there's some, something else comes up, but it's not necessarily even, I don't think we're gonna get a lot of skipping the steps as much as we're going mm -hmm. to get officer using this five step to just understand mm -hmm. that I need to talk to people. I need to explain things to people. I need to ask people to do things. And it, it becomes very common after a while. And, you know, and most police officers are very good at this. It's just, you know, knowing that 
you know, the consequences if you don't. So it may not be like, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. It's just like, you know, you're talking to people like a normal person. Right. I think it's just that um, in our community, when you listen to those that have a, um, have or have had a negative impact with police officers, sometimes it's things that they don't know and don't take the time to answer the questions. But then when they are retelling the story, sometimes even bystanders don't get that, hey, is there something else that we can do? This is the reason that I stopped you. Sometimes, and I have been firsthand in that, you don't get these steps. So it's good to know that there are steps that they're supposed to be taken. And when they're not taking, how a person can politely and correctly and lawfully respond to what's going on. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think it's important to understand too that, um, and we're gonna go over this a little bit later, but to understand that officers need to be professional at all times, you know, and calm and talking to people. And um, one of the um, videos that I use on how to do everything wrong, <laughs> um, and is everybody on the board familiar with the Sandra Bland case, I assume? Don't assume. <laughs> okay, so the Sandra Bland case was the officer that stopped um, a female for a, uh, a very minor violation. I think it was failed to signal or something like that. And Sandra Bland was stopped and this officer- The Texas case started out okay, but he took things personal and you can't th take things personal, you have to remain professional. And it is my opinion that things got suddenly worse when he was angry with her because she would not put out her cigarette. And I'm thinking, my gosh, just let her smoke her cigarette. Give her her warning ticket for her minor violation. And that officer escalated everything. And just kind of on a, on a side note, um, some of you may know who Sharon Cooper is, that's Sandra's sister. So on a side note, I was uh, involved in a panel discussion and, and uh, Sharon Cooper was on the panel. And I had the opportunity to talk to her before, after, and have a couple more conversations with her later. And, but before the panel discussion, I said, you know, this is what I use and this is how I use it in my class. And I had just taught it that day. I said, are you comfortable with me, you know, talking about that? And so I did. And, but uh, she was very impressed the way the University of Illinois Police Training Institute trains in de-escalation training, trains in vehicle stops. And um, I actually did a, uh, you know, got a little spot on uh, Al Jazeera and a couple other things where I was able to talk about what we do based on her being impressed about what we do, so. Any other questions on the five step? Apparently not. Okay. All right. So this is a part that's difficult and really a lot of police officers that are experienced and used to having people angry are good at staying under control. Experienced officers, good experienced officers that you know, it's just, they realize this is my job. I'm getting yelled at. I don't need to get angry back. And it's in, but I would say for um, my advice for, uh, you know, civilians would be non-police would be to slow down your breathing. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with, you know, mindfulness training, uh, you know, meditation, things like that. I'm not saying stop and meditate, but there, there are certain breathing techniques that have been proven scientifically that will lower your heart rate, reduce your blood pressure, and reduce the stress hormones in your body. And so sometimes just taking those slower and deeper breaths will help you stay under control because it's hard to stay under control sometimes in those you know, very emotional um, situations. All right, so we have something called professional face and personal face. And the thing is, we, we, we don't want to take things personal. We have to remain professional and because we have to remember who we're representing. And sometimes when 
one person within a profession does something that's awful, it reflects on the entire organization. And that goes for any job ever. That goes for, you know, teachers, doctors, whatever, people that, you know, we need to remain professional. So, you know, the police officer is, is representing um, their agency, they're representing their supervisor, their, their chief or sheriff. Um, they're, they're representing, um, you know, the whole community. They're representing themselves. They're representing their family. And so we cannot take things personal. We have to remain professional. So, so we have to remember I'm, and, and in policing, I'm representing, if I do something wrong, I know I'm representing all police everywhere. So it's important that we remain professional um, because we know if we don't, that's only gonna e escalate things. And I, I think what we need to remember is that, you know, if somebody's angry and yelling, okay, and, and, and yelling at me, maybe even things saying things personal about me, you know, Slosser, you short little bald, blah, 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 you know, or whatever. I mean, they're angry and they're cussing and they're yelling at me. They're probably angry at the situation. They're probably angry at themselves. And it's, or, or just maybe of how things are today, you know, in society. And they're, but they're, they don't know, may not know you personally. They may not know Officer Mike, you know, as a person who's kind of a silly guy that tells dad jokes all the time and is, is a dad and, a, you know, a husband and a son. And, and, you know, I like the same things other people like and, and my, you know, my sports, my, my bears and cubs. And, you know, they, they don't know me as a person that I, I am also a, a, a citizen. And I don't know if you can tell that I'm a Bears fan, but back over my shoulder here is a picture of Walter Payton, if you were wondering who that was. Um, so if we realize that they're not angry at us, we can just, I can say to myself, hmm, Mike, that sounds like they're angry at me, but because of my training, I know they're not really angry at me. They're just angry, not me personally. So I don't have to take it personal, right? So um, we have a little saying um, in de-escalation, and this was created by Doc Thompson's Verbal Judo. If it feels good, don't say it. And that could be a couple of things because sometimes under stress and when somebody's angry, you know, because we're all human and we have emotions too, we might have we might resort to being angry back or we might resort to being so wise and clever and sarcastic that we say some wise crack remark back to people instead and those things can escalate whether it's getting angry back or just saying some comment that you shouldn't say that's just real smart aleck comment that kind of puts them in their place so if it feels good kind of is, is the slogan, don't say it. All right, so here's some, I've been teaching this so long that I none of these are mine. I've had people send me things that they've said before and I thought I'd share them with you. <laughs> um, so here's some feel good, don't say it. Hey, how about never? Is that good for you? I see you've set aside this special time to humiliate yourself in public. Feel good? Don't say it. You know, I'll try being nicer if you try being more intelligent. You know, I'd, I'd really like to help you out. Which way did you come in? Have a nice day somewhere else. Or the one my son used to say to me, hey dad, you hear that? That's the sound of no one caring. <laughs> so, but I wrote him a traffic ticket anyway. So not related to him saying that, he just deserved it. So but I'll, I don't have time for that story. <laughs> but all right, all right, little video clip, little, Video clip feels good, don't say it. Some of you might be familiar with this. I can't hardly show this to the recruits anymore because they've never heard of this movie. Hey Mike. And here. We can't necessarily hear this. So what you'll need to do is if you stop sharing your screen for a minute and then click to reshare it, and then oh. you should see a little uh, box there that you can optimize for video and audio. Okay, I'm not getting anything at the bottom with this up. Right, you'll need to uh, stop your sharing. I'll go ahead and stop the sharing. Okay. And now I share again. Is that what I go to again, share screen? Correct. Yeah, you'll go ahead and share again, and then you should see a little box at the bottom there where you can optimize it for audio and video. 
optimize share computer sound or optimize screen sharing for video clip? Which one? You can click both of those. Well, thank you. It's nice having smart people on board here. All right, now I go back to that and share it. Correct. And let's go back to the beginning. And let's try it again. Thank you very much, appreciate that. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. All right. And does anybody know the movie? Anybody? Tony Madison. Who said that? I did, Tony. Tony, you get an A today, Tony. Hey, I can't see you guys again. Is there a way so I can see your faces again? Usually very top with all the little squares, or you can punch on gallery. Oh, my gosh, my gosh. Okay, so there's, I'm at the top, and I'm back to, like, screen share. There's more. Should I go to more? Yeah, it depends on how big your screen or... So, so how about side by side mode under view options at the very top view i uh, should help you see little tiny people on the right okay so i've got record meeting info disable hide names show video panel um none of those no nope. all right the very bottom participants I've got a participants. Okay. There should be, when you click on it. You click on the little arrow thing and all it says is invite. Yes. Yeah. So Mike, Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if you can see where um, it says that city of Urbana is talking right now, kind of up by your uh, upper right, but it's minimized right there. So right, if you go to where city of Urbana is talking and click one of the squares, I go to the top right, I have a stop share and I have you are screen sharing. So not all the way to the right or all the way to the top, but you will see on the right hand side and then down a little bit from where you are. Does it say where city of Urbana is talking and up a little bit from where you are right now? No, got nothing. Got stuff up here. Can you, can you guys see like my little pointy thing going to stuff or not? Yeah. We see your little pointy thing. All right, so do you see anything there that would look like it would help? Well, I don't necessarily see the uh, menu options there. I just see your, oh, okay. your pointy thing going across to what's a, a black box. Okay, so I've got more remote control, annotate, pause, new share. And then when so, I so it shouldn't be in that. If you click down, like on the actual PowerPoint slide, to get rid of that menu option. I'm not even, yeah, okay. And then up towards the uh, upper right, you should have a little box there where it says city of Urbana talking or shows the city logo. I do not. Maybe put on full screen or exit full screen. Maybe he's just not seeing the options because of space. There you guys are. Okay. So now are you guys seeing me now or are you seeing my screen? Only you. Only me. Okay. So now I go back to, it says screen sharing has stopped. So do I click okay on that? Yeah. And then, but then you'll have to go share it again to keep going on the PowerPoint, right? All right. 
now you're just seeing the PowerPoint. It's happened to me before. At that point, it gets really disorienting for the speaker. Well, I tell you what, I'll just have to pretend I can see you. You guys okay with that? I can hear you. No, we don't have an option, so. Okay, all right. Being arrested, I just have to say yes. <laughs> okay, all right, well, well, we'll keep going. But can you see me in the corner and I can't see yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Good. All right, so I feel better. I, I have a question or maybe a comment, Mike, uh, and, and I want to make it public because it's, it's funny that you were talking about the, 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 the lady in Texas. Um, you're not a current policeman, right? Correct. I'm retired. But, that's right. But if we heard more policemen say what you said about, you know, the guy should have, should have, Yes, it's, it, it would make such a difference. Most of us get mad when we look at those things because the video is showing what the video is showing without any other implication. Uh, but as a rational person, I see the police officer escalating it and saying, I, I don't I don't say dummy. Uh, I'm not thinking police mind at all. I'm thinking the person there and what would I do? I'm sitting on the chair. Sure. You know that that's I can't I cannot imagine myself being a cop and taking it personal. All I know is that he's telling me things that are completely against what I should be doing, and yet I'm supposed to be complying because he wants whatever. He wants to take control. That's the way it feels like, and it's yes, indignant, and then mad, and then what? Defense, and so because we don't hear policemen. And I understand, you know, you don't want to criticize each other, but when we don't hear that voice that is a lot more rational than what we're watching, I think it escalates things for everybody. And so I'm glad to hear you say it, but in, if in your instruction you, you, you pervade the, the mentality of the person sitting, it would really help. Because right now yeah. I, I, am, I cannot think of that video without thinking, getting mad. Yeah, and, and we, we use these videos not only from the police perspective, but we also say, okay, let's say you are that person. We, we want officers to kind of put themselves in the other person's shoes to build their empathy up. So it's, when, we, when we analyze a video, it's from the police officer's point of view, it's from the, the, the civilian's point of view, it's what they're saying, it's how they're saying it, it's what are the tactics they're using. It's, you know, and, it, and, and so it's like, in a way it's like if we, you know, have a, you know, are, are playing football and having all the video filmed from the next day and we try to find things that we can do better. I mean, this is much more serious than we're trying to do. It is, it's true, but the, the, but the civilians don't get a training like this so they can swap places. All right. we hear is the guy on the video. And even if we don't hear it, we imagine those policemen saying that and telling their stories like anybody talking shop. They just have good stories to tell. Yeah. And and, unfortunately, and, that's the one we hear. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of times when there's videos, when you're not hearing what's being said, um, there's times where the officers said everything right and done everything right and it still ended up ugly. Um, and I think there's times where police officers will see things and hear things and say, yeah, that was really bad. That was really ugly. Um, but I, I think that a lot of officers and people that have, have formed their opinions about certain things in our lives, you know, it's, it's easy to, you know, we're divided as it is as a nation, but it's, it's easy to, you know, have this confirmation bias, right? It's, it's, it's very true. And, and yeah. of course it works in all ways, as much as there are people that already step into the situation to see that on, on, on the video, as much as there are uh, policemen that expect violence and that, and they act as if there were violence and all it was, was the lady saying no, because she didn't understand. Right, and that, and that's what fortunately to... by that you can be so wired that you will only hear what you want to hear, because that's the gear up that you have. Yeah, and and I, and I think too the, you know when I talk about confirmation bias, which is what I do with the recruits, especially if I'm going to start talking about implicit bias and race and and racism and the intersection of police and race, I you know, we all have a tendency to 
have Facebook friends and seek knowledge and believe everything that aligns with our beliefs and our attitudes. And we have a tendency, even if this other is correct, to discard it or not remember it or see it differently. And so, and, and this is just the way our mind works. It doesn't, you know, we just have to try to step back and not have this, you know, try to work on our consciousness and look at things more objectively. And some of the best things that you can do for that is, you know, if you're a Fox person, watch CNN also, watch MSNBC. And I know it's like blogs and all that podcast stuff now, but I'm too old to even know how to do all that stuff, you know, to try to listen to other perspectives. You know, it's like when we have our class on uh, policing in a multiracial society and we have uh, a panel come in, a diverse panel, and to hear, you know, in, in critical race theory, we call that counter storytelling. And so we, we need to hear other people's perspectives, other people's point of views, and try to, you know, open our, you know, try to be more objective about, you know, as we're learning information. And <clears throat> when it comes to like biases and implicit bias, and, and, you know, we all have biases based on, you know, age and gender and race and occupation and how somebody speaks or how they dress. Um, because we've had a way of organizing things in our mind a certain way based on every single life experience that we've had. And I always say the best way to reduce your biases is to be, develop true friendships and true relationships with people that are different than you. So, I mean, that's a whole nother little thing that goes on here at PTI, you know, this isn't necessarily the, um, you know, the de-escalation part, but I just thought I'd throw that in because I think, I, I agree, I think that's important. Some, but two people can watch the same thing and see something completely different based on their identity and, and their beliefs. So, make sense? I guess so. Any other comments before I go on? All right, I'm going on. All right, so we also have what we call um, in our, in our non and de-escalation training, we also have what we call tactical respect and tactical empathy. And what I would truly like is for, if possible, I would like, you know, officers in every or most situations to have true empathy to treat people with respect. So, you know, if we can, you know, if we can get to know our community and get to know members of our community, make more non-enforcement contacts and let people get to know me as Mike and let me get to know them as a person, you know, that's, that's helpful. And, and if we start to understand that everybody we arrest is not necessarily a bad person, we're getting called when times are bad. We are, we are, you know, we have to understand that, you know, people have issues. They have, you know, alcohol issues, maybe substance, other substance abuse issues. They have financial problems. They have relationship problems. And these problems build up and then we get called there when things are at their worst. And it might, that person might not be an awful person. They just have experienced things in their life that maybe the officer hasn't. But so the overall goal is to realize that, okay, not everybody we arrest is a bad person. It's that bad time. And if we can have some empathy and understanding and respect, you know, for that. But that being said, if, if that's not the case, then we just make it a tactic. So if, if, if the officer's not feeling it, I'm not feeling empathy for this person, you know, the way they're treating me and yelling at me and spitting on me and all of that, I'm not feeling that empathy, you know, then we simply still have to treat them with respect. So it's tactical respect, tactical empathy to reach our goals of, of um, com compliance and, and collaboration. So if we think of it as a tactic and we at least use that, knowing that things are more likely to deescalate, then we need to show that and how we do that also is, is, is you know, going through the different things we're teaching in de-escalation and, and making sure that, you know, that tone of voice and how we're treating people and talk to, talking to people and understanding. Um, and then there's also times where police officers are arresting somebody and, you know, I've, I've arrested people before that, you know, and they're in front of their friends and they're cussing and they're yelling at me, Slosser, you short little bald MF, and if you didn't have a gun and a badge, I'd kick, you know, blah, 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 while they're turning around and putting their hands behind their back. See, that's a cooperative person. So I would simply put my cuffs on, yeah, I'm glad you didn't fight, you probably can. And then I've gotten that person into my vehicle before and they've said, yeah, hey, Officer Mike, you know, I was just saying that because my friends were there, are we still cool? I'm, yeah, we're still cool. So if, if you're accomplishing your goals, then and they're, it's, it's allowing that person to save face in front of their friends. You know, I know I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to comply. 
but I have to show that I'm, I'm tough and I have to say these things. And if we understand that they're just saving face and they're not really angry at us, that's also very helpful. Now I'm not getting my thing to advance, isn't that nice? I love technology. I'm not getting it to do anything. If it continues to not advance, Mike, what I would do is uh, stop your sharing. Oh, I got oh, it, I got it. Moved. Uh, on a roll, like butter. Okay, here we go. All right, so here's the other trick, and this goes for everybody, okay? Civilians, uh, cops, and everybody. And it's important to be a act, good active listener. And the truth is, people are not good at being an active listener. Most people are waiting to talk. And here's how you can test that. So you're sitting around with your friends and you're having a conversation about whatever. And once you figure out in your mind the more brilliant thing you're going to add to that conversation, you've stopped listening to them. And in fact, you may even interrupt them. So it takes practice because if somebody's angry and they're yelling and cussing between all that yelling and cussing, they might be saying things that they're truly upset about and you're able to pick up on that and able to start paraphrasing some things back. And then, you know, it sounds like you're upset about this and, and might create some dialogue. But if we don't, if we're not good active listeners, and then we're not going to be able to do that. So, the, you know, the goal is to generate voluntary compliance, cooperation, and even collaboration. So, you know, kind of what I'm talking about, about people not sounding like they're cooperating, but they are cooperating. So as long as you accomplish your goals, what they're saying doesn't really matter. You know, say what you want, do what I say. You can have the last word, I have the last act, because I'm not going to take it personal. They're complying with me. All right, so we also have what's called anti-peace phrases. And sometimes it's just so natural for anybody when you walk into a situation where people or, or somebody's yelling and, and upset, to just simply say, hey, calm down. Well, calm down doesn't work. I don't even care how you say it. Hey, just calm down. You know, calm down is not going to calm anybody down. And just these are just examples of things <coughs> not to say. Um, you know, what's your problem? And I hope everybody gets this one. You people, you know, hey, come over here. I'm not going to tell you again. And of course, most cops will tell you again, <laughs> you know, hey, because these are the rules. Now, if you're working in a job and this is the policy and you're trying to get somebody to comply, I don't want you to say, hey, that's the policy. What I want you to be able to do is, you know, sir, the reason I'm asking you to do this is because our, this is our policy. And the reason our policy exists if you can get that next step in why that policy was created, that can be very helpful. And of course, these, these are, you know, business, you know, why don't you be reasonable? And, you know, everybody even being unreasonable thinks they're being reasonable. They're not gonna stop and say, oh, Mike, thanks. You told me I was not being reasonable. Now I'm gonna be reasonable. You know? And you know what, you wouldn't understand. There you're calling somebody stupid. So you may as well finish your sentence. You know what, you wouldn't understand because you're really stupid that's what they hear and what do you want me to do about it so these are the things not to say and the calm down is i think the hardest for people not to say when things are escalating so wish me luck guys on this one everybody got their fingers crossed are you crossing your fingers i need for i'm, I'm real here are you yeah. okay yeah. yes all right thank you that sounds like we're voting on something <laughs> I make a motion for everybody to cross their fingers. Let's see, here we go. I, I can just watch the movie with you. Excuse me, can I get a headset? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, miss? I'll be right there, sir. Where's your headset? She's busy right now, but it's coming. For crying out loud, you're missing important plot points. Ma'am? Could you give me a second, sir? Excuse me. Could I maybe get that headset, please? 
Do not raise your voice to me, sir. I wasn't raising my voice. Okay, just calm down. I am calm. I just want my headset. Sir, our country is going through a very difficult time right now, and if you're not going to cooperate... I don't know where a headset ties into patriotism. Is there a problem here, sir? I, I don't think so. Can you come to the back of the plane with me so we can have a talk? A talk about what? There's not a problem. This the steward is just... The flight attendant. The flight attendant keeps ignoring me when I ask... Calm down. I am calm. What is it with you people? You people. Oh, now, wait a minute. I don't mean you people. I mean you people. Sir, I will not tolerate any racist behavior on the plane. This is a very difficult time for our country. I, I know that. I'm not a racist. I just want to watch the movie. I'm only going to say this one more time, sir. Calm down. I'm calm! All right. And the movie was... Anybody? I have no idea. Nobody does? Have you heard of anger management? Oh, I was going to say that, but I couldn't get my unmute quick enough. Oh, okay. Well, I believe you. <laughs> Good so trick. You, so, you, so you get the A, okay? I'm not going to leave you without your A. Uh, all right. So I think when I started talking earlier, I said, if you kind of get the concept of the five step, right, we need to ask people, take the time to explain things. And the consequences if they don't and we're on their side we don't want that for them that's the basics of the five step right um and then i also said that empathy deflection phrases are are key so it will prevent me from saying those things that feel good it'll give me a little bit of time to think about what i want to say but these phrases can show empathy within themselves okay so i can say things like and i'll get, give you some other examples of how to use these in a minute but you know, I can appreciate what you're saying. You know, they're angry. You know, I understand how you feel. You know, I can understand that. You know, I can appreciate that. And these are all mix and match. You know, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I can understand where you're coming from. You know, I believe that and I can appreciate what you're saying. You know, I, I can see you're upset and I can understand that. So we're showing this understanding. We can appreciate where they're at. We're showing some empathy. We're, you know, in a little bit of respect at the same time. So um here's some more um i appreciate what you're saying and i understand that i'm sorry you feel that way you know i understand you're upset i appreciate that you know i would be too kind of like i get it i would be upset too you know i i, I hear you ma'am I, I understand you ma'am i hear what you're saying you know i believe that you know and i understand how you feel so these again are not from me but they're from people over the years that have sent to me what they started using within, within their businesses within their, um, you know, where they work. So um, one group just started doing this and, and they said, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I'm asking you to wait in line so I can be fair to the other people who've been waiting in line longer than you. You know, I can appreciate what you're saying, you know, but we can get this accomplished a lot quicker if we can get this form completed first and I'll help you with it if you would like. You know, I can see you're upset and, and I probably be upset too. That's a nice one to show that empathy. I would probably be upset too, but the reason we have this policy is, and then you need to know the reason for the policy. You know, I understand how you feel, but in order to help you, and I do want to help you, okay, we're on their side again. You know, I understand that, but in order to resolve the situation, I think the best route to take is, you know, I hadn't thought about that, you know, and I can understand where you're coming from. You know, I'll bring that up to my supervisor, but let's see what I can do for you today. You know, I'd like to be able to, um, assist you now rather than waiting. And this one was sent to me by a supervisor who kept getting called for everything. And so they wanted to things get maybe settled without having to call them every time. You know, you know, I appreciate you called and I understand your concern. I wish more parents took an interest in their child's education. Now, these actually are, are from my wife um, who just retired after 36 years of teaching first grade at the same school in the same classroom. And she would have angry parents calling and even the angry ones, she would say, you know, I wish more parents took an interest in their child's education. You know, I appreciate you took the time to, you know, bring this to my attention because a lot of parents don't take the time. You know, they're upset about the homework. So, you know, the idea of homework is not to punish and it shouldn't be to the point of frustration, but it should be challenging. You know, there's no reason we can't find an alternate assignment. 
maybe you can pick just up, you can just pick out 10 words to practice. So Mike is still getting practice on sight words, but it won't overwhelm him. You know, I can see you're upset and I can understand that, but since you don't have the documentation with you, I'm unable to go any further. Is there any way you can bring it back in? It certainly won't take long once you do. The reason we require that is so that no one else can obtain your inf private information. And these have all been sent to me over the years from different groups. So, um, so that's, that's the basic. I just, I, I, I've had so much luck over the years, you know, using these things as, as a cop that just using these deflection phrases to keep myself from saying things I shouldn't and showing that empathy and showing that understanding and just, you know, showing that I'm on their side and I'm for them. So now we have the art of interruption. So sometimes you're talking to people that they just, they, they won't shut up. And remember, words don't always work and this doesn't always work. But if you can make it all about them, they just may stop talking and start listening. You know, I may say something like, you know, sir, I can see you're upset, but I just, you know, I, I want to I make sure I understand what you're telling me. What you're telling me is, and we're paraphrasing back what we're hearing because we're active listeners. You know, I want to make sure I understand you. You know, I, you know, I want to make sure I get, this is important. I want to make sure I get this right, what you're telling me is. So anything like that where you make it about them, then there is a chance that they might be like, okay, I want to see if you understand. And then they might say, well, no, that's not really what I was mad about. Okay, so to be able to you know, use some type of deflection phrase or empathy phrase and paraphrase back to somebody and know that I want to get this right. I want to make sure I understand you. Things like that can be very helpful. And then we have what's called tactical peace phrases. And if you just skim through those, I call those just being polite. So please and thank you go a long way. My mom taught me. All right, so when, when we approach somebody, whether it's in, in business or in police, it's always good to introduce, introduce yourself. Um, it's good to, to explain your title or your position because then they know that you're in a position where you can help them or you have the authority. And if possible, if things are going bad where you're talking to somebody at your business or your company, and, and it's nice if you can take them aside. And um, so, you know, I'm, good afternoon, sir. I'm Officer Slosser with Rantoul Police Department. Um, can you step over here and chat, chat with me for a minute? I think I can help you out. But there's also times where a second person comes up and they, they seem to, for whatever reason, um, kind of more able to get, develop some sort of rapport. So that's why that other person or the other officer coming up sometimes can, can make a difference because they may have just for some reason be able to develop a better rapport. And of course, we need to know when it's time to act. So if you're, you know, if you're working at, at uh, whatever job you have and things get really ugly and you feel like, you know, these things are, it's already to the point where these things aren't going to work, then, you know, just go ahead and act, which means maybe getting the heck out of there, maybe getting the red folder or whatever, but, you know, just we know that things can get bad at any time. So Doc Thompson, uh, my mentor, who actually learned and taught a lot about different cultures and people with different backgrounds. And um, we understand cultural competency is important, but, you know, but especially here on campus, it's, it's, it would be difficult to understand everybody's background, everybody's culture, everybody's upbringing and learn about all of the different people from all over the place in the world. Right. So Doc Thompson said, you know what, instead of focusing on how people are different, we should focus on how people are the same. And his five universal truths are all people want to be treated with dignity and respect. All people want to be asked rather than being told to do something. All people want to be told why they're being asked to do something. All people want to be given options, not threats. And all people want a second chance and many deserve a second chance. And you can kind of see how those align with the, uh, with the five step. And if it feels good, you guys know the rest? Somebody? Feels good? Do we say it? Don't, Don't say it. it. Say Very it. good. Very good. All right. So um, this has taken a little bit of time. We can, we can um, end it there, or I can show you um, a video where you can kind of hear how the five step works and the deflection phrases work. Do you have time for that, or do you want to? I mean, because that's the gist of it, but. It's up to you guys. Short video. 
Time to speak yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm good for whatever, but of course I can't see anything, so I'll just listen. Okay, I wish you could see. Mike, I do want to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to envision, you know, learning how to be polite uh, is, um, it's kind of hard to pick up as an adult. You know, as, as kids, we either learn it or not. And I have to say, of all my kids, not all of them are polite. I've got to, you know, still go back to them. But on the other hand, I'm looking at, so how do you train that and how do you bring it on to, you know, the adults? Even if, I mean, the youngest person that you're going to have in training is what, 21, 22? Yeah, 21 or 20 if they're going to be 21 before they graduate. And, and I think we have the ability that other academies don't have. Um, you know, we're, we're teaching this, you know, along with wanting the true respect and empathy and all of that, but we're also teaching it as these are police tactics. Okay, you have police tactics for takedowns and control holds. You have police tactics for, you know, vehicle stops. You have police tactics for different things. These are tactics that are going to keep things from de-escalating, and this is going to make you a professional off officer. And we have the ability to practice these skills in dozens and dozens of scenarios in small groups. And it's like, so they're practicing their scenario, small groups, maybe one, two officers had doing the scenario. And then it's also important after the scenario to have a good facilitator to facilitate a discussion. Um, and even the small group, the people that aren't going that are watching, they can pick up on these things. And so, they get a lot of practice and you know ideally i would love to have officers practice this you know periodically um, throughout their career and a lot of them do because i will visit you know our local agencies and and you know give them updated and retrain and things like that but you know there's only well, for our purposes i see two reasons why this is important to us one uh, we need to see what the police are trained with so that we can establish a basic a, a criteria to say and you didn't do that or you did do that thank you right because a mm -hmm. complaint might come in and it, it's hard once you're pulled over or you're approached by a police officer you know it, it it's there is a physical and a mental and emotional reaction so it's good for us to know what they're being trained on uh for that reason the other one is just that Darn it, we, we as regular people have little sense of, of, of the criteria that they're supposed to be applying. Uh, we're just regular people that were either taught to be polite or not, and that's, what, that's the only tool we have. I mean, not to excuse, but we just don't have that interaction and we didn't have a mic to go through practice with. Um, yeah. But for me, I think as I'm, as I'm looking at it, I, I, I'm mentally looking as to your, you telling them, I can imagine that, you know, some of them, the ones that are polite are saying that's obvious. The ones that aren't polite are laughing. Uh, it is not unusual for in trainings for people that look at the video and say, that's exactly what happened to me. Or I just saw a gym do that or whatever else, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it might be interesting also for me to observe how the police uh, trainees react to the training, you know, blurring out faces, whatever, but just to see some of that. I want to make, in my mind, uh, I want to ingrain that this real people are listening to this and taking it seriously or what questions they might have or what problems they might have. I don't know. Sorry. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take that one step further. Um, we're very proud of how we train at the Police Training Institute. And if anybody on your board wants to come and visit and watch some of our scenario-based training, you know, to, to see how these recruits are doing, um, you know, we, we, we're not an academy like a lot of them where they learn everything the first however many weeks and then the last week or two we bring in scenarios. Our scenarios are scattered throughout the entire academy with very simple things to begin with. They get more complex, they get higher risk as they go along so that they've already have this framework when things get more serious. Um, and we're very proud of how we, how we train. And if anybody on the board wants to come 
interested and sit in on any training, you are certainly welcome. We have nothing to hide. We're very proud of what we do. Um, and if you do, you send me an email and I look at the schedule and find out when scenarios are and give you an idea of, you know, hey, here, here's some scenarios. Would you be interested in watching the domestic violence scenarios or the, you know, investigative stop scenarios um, or vehicle stops or whatever you want to watch? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to have uh, have you guys come and watch. All right. Thank you for, for offering. Um, I think it, it, it is important for us to enrich our, ourselves, especially I've never had any kind of police training. Except yeah, and, exposure. And, 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 and another suggestion, and I know people on the board have done this before, but um, once this COVID thing gets to the point where I can start offering our Citizens Police Academy, we do that every spring, and it's uh, 10 Thursday nights in a row from six to nine with speakers in different areas of policing. And um, I, I think it's very valuable to learn more about police work in general. And then at the end of it, um, a ride along is offered. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever done ride alongs, but uh, you know, that's, that's part of the program too. And you what, well, police officers come in, we'll have, you know, state's attorney come in, we'll have different, just different people and trying to learn about, you know, police training here specifically and laws and do's, you know, things like that. So I, I, so that's the citizen police training. Actually, it just triggered something that I think uh, we members of the board need to reiterate. Um, our, our Urbana Police Department has uh, made an exception since COVID, you know, ride alongs are not normal. No yeah. one else is allowed, including recruits, but they've invited us to uh, do ride alongs. Uh, Excellent. So we are, we are invited and you, you know, you can just contact Rich and he'll direct the mail to do. We are actually required to do ride-alongs and uh, I, I, I find them a, a really good experience. Um, yeah, I think that's important for you guys to do and I'm not surprised that, surprised that uh, Urbana allows that. They're, they're very good at, uh, you know, doing things like that. So excellent idea. Do, do a ride-along. Do more than one. Yeah, we, we're required several hours. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, for Dr. Slosser, and if not, we can take this and, and, and in essence, you know, close the tape on this one. If there's especially anything that you think that you might have wanted to, to, to hear and leave it for the new people that will come in and watch this tape instead of getting the trainings live. Anybody? Oh, this, is, this is Katrina again, sorry. Um, in your de-escalation training with all of your scenarios, um, how much of those scenarios deal with mental health? Well, I think we're the only academy that's done this, but I think it was about three or four years ago, I brought in um, an entire four hour block of scenarios on interacting with people with various mental health issues and in, in crisis. And the thing is, I think also it's important what we do that might be different than some of the other academies is all of our role players um, are trained in how to be a role player on how to, you know, they're all trained in, in de-escalation training. They're, they're trained in, you know, some of the mental health stuff so that they actually know their role and they know how to respond accordingly to, to the officers and, and how they're doing. And, they, some officers, you know, early on might come in on a domestic and just say, hey, calm down, and then they raise it up a little bit, but then things get kind of ugly, but then they realize we're learning, and then the officers start figuring out, oh, I need to use these skills, and they start bringing it back down for them. But uh, And the people, the ages of the people that you use for your role play, do you use teenagers in your role play or elderly in your role play or... Um, non-English speaking people in your role play or do you use the same type all the time, an adult male or an adult? No, it, our, our, the, the, age, the age and, and yeah, it, it varies. It varies a lot. I mean, yeah, our oldest might be, well, I don't want to say how old because he might be listening and I might guess too old, but, <laughs> but yeah, that, that varies. Mike, how do you measure, this is Tony Allegretti, um, how do you measure the internalization of this training um, in, in, a, 
in a statistical way or as opposed to just observing uh, or how do you, how do you measure it, I guess? Yeah. So, so what we do is we have um, our trained facilitators um, to facilitate the discussion at the end and, you know, we can watch them progress and we can, I mean, we don't really have a way to, to gather this data and have some empirical research on it, but we do, um, you know, there are red flags and I have removed recruits who have shown those red flags and not able to pick up on this. Um, and I've probably removed more recruits than uh, any previous director, but the majority of the ones I, re I remove are an integrity issue. It may be a, somewhat of a minor thing they did wrong, but they lied about it and they're automatically gone. You know, we have to, this is, this is part of the hiring process. Hiring process is your interview, getting hired, completing successfully the police training institute, completing your field training program and, and completing your probationary period. You have a lot of time there to evaluate people. And when they go to the field training officer, they're getting evaluated daily. And um, so, and I, and I think the good thing about the field training compared to when I started in 1984 is that there's so much better training for the field training officers and the selection process is so much better than in 1984 because I'll be honest with you, when I started, you know, if somebody would be a training officer, they didn't have to go to field training school for a long time. And then maybe it wasn't a real great school to go to. Um, and, you know, maybe people were doing it for the wrong reasons. They were saying, oh, I get an extra, back then, 84 will say, I get an extra 50 cents an hour. So I'm gonna sign up for field training. No, you're, you're gonna, we're gonna know you as an officer. We're gonna know, you know, how you treat people. We're gonna know how you write your reports. We're gonna know, you know, things about you and we are going to interview people and we are going to make sure that we pick the best field training officers. Um, so we've improved in training so much from, from you know, I'm, I'm giving my age here, I guess, from 84 when I started in policing. Yes, I'm old, um, but uh, still feel pretty young. Hang, hang it in there. So I hope that answers. I guess I have, I, oh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, hi, Mike, this is Scott, I'm on the phone. Um, I mean, inevitably these systems are gonna break down and, um, you know, you have a mix of officers that are at a scene and everybody is hyped up, you know, looking for the gun or whatever. And uh, no matter how internalized training is, things are, you know, there's the potential for things to get out of hand. And so I guess my question is, I mean, you, you've talked a lot about officers, you know, put, patrol people, you know, they're in the academy, so they're learning. Are there any specific trainings that you or other people officer offer, which would be more on like a patrol a commander or like a sergeant level? Um, you know, when you inevitably have these breakdowns, hopefully there's going to be somebody who can kind of pick up from where you are and move forward and maybe come in with a, you know, a, a more effective kind of de-escalation strategy, sort of like a second tier. Um, are there scenarios that you develop that are specifically about that? Uh, and, uh, you know, an area I'm mo interested in uh, recently, especially is, you know, whether people who are trained in uh, social worker psychology uh, can be brought in to kind of insert themselves in these points the, at that point. And of course, there, there's a lot of, about command structure there. Um, so I guess the simple question is, do you do this for shift commanders as well as for uh, new officers? Good question. Um, the majority of the training that command officers are going to get are going to be specialized schools that they're that they're sent to. A lot of them might go to the FBI Academy for so long, or or, or training at uh, Northwestern Institute or whatever uh, whatever's called up north. And um, also, there's continued training through our mobile team units around the state um, for veteran officers, and there's special schools for um, you know for different levels of uh, you know whether it's sergeant, lieutenant, captain, whatever. 
Um, so we do not do that uh, specifically. Um, okay, so 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 that so the need for something like this is recognized and available. So then it becomes up to individual departments to facilitate that further training for you know like command staff. Yeah, so way, like, yeah, chiefs and sheriffs have additional training that's mandated just like everybody else does below them. And their training is more specialized um, in, in the leadership aspect. Something I wanna, um, there's, there's also something called crisis intervention training and that's a week long class. And that's a little more um, intense, a little more in depth, which involves a, a lot of uh, de-escalation and involving people in, in, in crisis. Um, my, my dream would be to have every single officer after they leave the PTI for us to have trained them in um, crisis intervention training. Um, I couldn't convince the Illinois uh, Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board of that, but we do give them some of that. We, we picked some of that up and we do train them in some of that. And also, it's, it's whenever there's a major incident, um, people are always brought in, and I know they, they do this for local agencies anyway, and the situation is debriefed. You know, what could we, what could we have done better? What went wrong here? Um, and so even let's say, let's say like somebody was saying earlier, so what if I have that officer that's just being a jerk and it's constant? Is it, you know, are, are they going through something themselves in their lives? You know, we need to know that. But I also have had area since we're here, right where, you know, Champaign-Urbana, Champaign County, I've had um, chiefs and, you know, the sheriff actually send, um, one of their officers back to PTI to go through some of the training with recruits for retraining. And um, so being here, you know, right here with, you know, in Champaign County, I'm able to say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna be teaching de-escalation training tomorrow, or I'm having these scenarios tomorrow and we can get them in these classes. So, and I don't charge anybody for that. They just come and they go through the class because, you know, we want, we want part of discipline is training. Right. And but if that training you continue to train and it's not working, then the discipline becomes more serious. And then officers can actually lose their job if, if they can't, you know, get their act together. You take returns, basically. Yeah, we'll take them just for specific things, whatever they think they need work on. It's common for us to do. So question triggered by the, the mention of the state. Um, have you been affected by cuts by training monies? Uh, uh, or is that the department gets cut and then they can't afford you? Or how does that happen? So if, if, if departments, um, yeah, so it, it used to be, well, let me just tell you how it is. I won't tell you how it used to be. So um, uh, it's, it's up to the agencies which academy they send officers to out of the seven academies. Uh, we're pretty popular. We have 84 on our waiting list for the next class. So um, they choose which academy, and then we bill out the academy, we bill the agencies for the the tuition for that 14 weeks and that's our that's our revenue um, the training board needs funds for all these extra trainings and the mobile mobile uh, team units and and their funding has been cut significantly and it you know it's like we want to do more training better training we want to at least hit our state mandates but when the the Illinois law enforcement training and standards board doesn't have the funds that's a problem and if an agency doesn't have the funds to send their officers to certain training, even if it's free training, they're still having to pay somebody overtime probably. And uh, most departments, you know, and, and here's where we go with defunding, most departments are underfunded and most are understaffed um, in the state. There's some that are doing really good shape, but probably more than not are not in good shape. And it's like, so if they're working minimum staffing, how can I convince them to have all of those non-enforcement contacts? Um, I was training a group the other day and I was telling about a, a study that I read. And so in this study, um, they, it was a pretty good sample size. So they had like 2000 in the study. So police officers in one neighborhood um, went and knocked on doors, a thousand doors, you know, or more. And they just knocked on the door and they said, hey, I'm Officer Slosser today. I just checking in. Is there any, everything okay in your neighborhood? Is there anything you want to talk about? And blah, blah, blah. Just like these little 15 minute conversations. And they had, you know, it was similar demographics and neighborhoods and things like that. And then they had the other thousand where they did not do that. And they did uh, like three different pre and post surveys. And where the ones that knocked on the door and just had those little conversations and got to know people, the, the trust and legitimacy from those was significantly different than the others. But if you don't have the manpower to have, you know, if, if 
especially during the summer, if you're really trying to go to call to call to call, when you're not on a call, you're trying to keep up with your reports and that's just the reality of police work. So we need the funds to do the things that I think we need to do. Cause I think we need continued and more training and more scenario based training throughout a career, um, more physical control tactics training because the better you are at that. I've always believed that officers that are, that are confident in their physical skills and controlling somebody confident in their verbal skills are less likely to go hands-on sooner, more likely to talk because they're confident in those things. I can see an officer that cussed at and they're just saying, you know, hey, sir, I can see you're upset. Um, you know, I probably would be too. If I could just get your ID from you, I can have you out of here, you know, and as opposed to getting into an argument. And we want so to coming back officer. to just to understand, there's a minimum state requirement for training and then that's what you offer in the 14 weeks. Well, we go beyond that by a lot. Yeah, plus or minus other, other well, plus other things that you do. Uh, is it fair to ask you how much would it take for somebody to pay the 14 weeks? Is it only departments that pay it or individuals pay it? It's the agencies that pay it. And um, I think that's probably open to the public and I'm transparent. So it's $6,000 per recruit. Okay. Well, 6,000 and like $14 or something like that. <laughs> So that is our that is kind of our primary source of revenue because we are a uh, self-supporting unit, and um, years ago we were getting about nine hundred thousand dollars a year from the university, and that's when they did a stewarding of excellence report and said, "Hey, you guys need to be self-supporting. You guys need to be involved in research. You guys need to be involved in public engagement and outreach. And if you can do that, you can stay open." So we cut full-time people. A lot of them. I hate to do that. Um, I'm involved in numerous research projects with uh, different people on campus and my public outreach is anybody that asks me to go speak about something, I go speak about something, you know, I'll share with them, I'll train people. Yeah, I mean, it's customers too. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions uh, as a group? Scotty, you're the only one that has the mic open uh, constantly, but oh, if not, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, no, no, Ricardo. You know, I, I guess I'm fine uh, with 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 you know what we've heard, and I appreciate uh, Mike's um, Mike's discussion and and everyone's participation. I still think there's a uh, an interesting scene here that that we can work and continue to talk about what to do when the de-escalation techniques and our command structure kind of breaks down. Uh, and so, you know, that's a long continuing discussion. So uh, thanks, Mike. I agree. All right. Thanks for having me. And I, didn't even, I didn't even miss my Cubs game tonight because they already played today and they lost. So I'm glad I missed that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, any Cardinals? Um, we're good then. Thank you very much for the training. Uh, we have a little bit more to do, uh, everyone, but we should uh, just be together, uh, stay together and keep talking. But Go all ahead, right. Mike. Thank all you right. very th much. Th thank you all again, and I'm always available for whatever you want to talk about. Good, bad, comfortable stuff, uncomfortable stuff. I do it all. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good. Is there any discussion uh, amongst the group uh, outside of Mike now uh, before we go on to public comment? I'm good. All right. So I, I, I agree with you, Scott, that we should go. I, I, it, my first reaction is to say, uh, what do, do, do officers get trained with the videos that we see of the, the really gross situations? Uh, probably. Uh, but do we, in, do we even take that up ourselves? We, we, we're doing it personally just because you know, we accept it to do this and it's high in our interest. I don't know, but maybe we can come back to that. Um, Ricardo, is it is it possible to get the training materials? Because I, I, I would like to think that what we were presented with today is not what the officers are getting um, in some respects. I mean, I know he walked us through it, but, um, you know, this seems very much um, like a community relations thing, like he described. Yeah. Very as opposed much. to the, the technical things that I think may be useful for us, especially if we're reviewing a, a, 
you know, video or a body cam. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Tony. I, uh, if, if this is it, then, 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 you know, we can form judgment. But if we don't know if this is it, we cannot, and, uh, uh, but we should. I think one of my interests is to triangulate. I think both from the public perspective, but I think it's, it's just a good practice uh, in this case to triangulate. And uh, we, I can ask, and I will ask, I put it on my list, uh, but I think the other thing we can do is one of us ought to go uh, and take him up on his offer to go to the, um, uh, go to the scenario training, go to this particular training and see uh, as, as he offers it to, to regular officers. Uh, I don't think it's insulting when somebody double checks on me or takes me up. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, I think it's, it's good relations to, to, to be confident that, that, you know, we're getting the full uh, version, especially as we see cases that are related to it. Each one of us, you know, has only done a certain part, but we can inform each other. We don't all have to go to everything. So if that's okay, I will ask to see uh, or, or what of the training materials is available to us and then we'll, if you don't mind, we'll take the next step of, but we should be exploring who, who can go. Um, I don't wanna burden uh, our, our group uh, too much, but we are in difficult times. And I think we all are remaining uh, can look at it and say, no, thank you when we can't. That's just natural. And we shouldn't feel uh, uh, bad about saying no thank you when our limit has been reached but in the meantime uh we'll look for these opportunities so uh i've put down training materials on my list ricardo one more thing i'm sorry yeah. I, I, we have aaron in our alley and they're telling me they're going to cut my power so i'm i'm gonna <laughs> all right go do go forth record all right sorry i this is unplanned but we we do what we can humans okay. all right Go ahead, you'll miss this part, but I think it's time. Uh, we have had several people patiently waiting, uh, one with their hand up. Uh, and so we should do, um, just make sure, Jason, are, are you ready for the back or is that Tamara? I'm not sure who does the... Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, you're ready. Uh, we'll do five minutes. I've never believed that we have to have limits, uh, but. Everybody wants to go home, so we should uh, we should use the clock as an aid as long as we're 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 having an uh, you know a, a conversation that that is uh, that is time well spent for everybody. But uh, make sure everybody then, if if it's looking badly as far as time, call it and we we you know we'll negotiate our way into that. So. Um, Jason, uh, Christopher, you're you're the first one with your hand up. Uh, if you'd like to make a contribution, Mr. Hansen, Christopher Hansen, uh, and yes, let's let's do the clock uh, just as a as a stepping device. Uh, and Mike is open for you, I think. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Christopher Hansen. I've lived in Urbana for 18 years. Um, well. Uh, that presentation was absolutely terrible. Uh, I feel like my evening has been wasted and it wasn't clear what anyone might have actually learned here. Uh, I think we should all realize that Michael Schlosser is really just a public relations clown for the police. Uh, he likes to use stupid little jokes in these dumb videos to try and charm people. But if you really listen to the content of his presentation, uh, he is presenting something that either does not represent how police actually operate or he fails to realize when police are doing something morally wrong. Uh, and it's, it's all just a puppet show to distract you from the rampant corruption within our police system. In, uh, in Schlosser's get out of the car setup, uh, where he engaged with Katrina, that, that was really just Schlosser being in imagination land. Uh, if K Katrina repeatedly said no to getting out of the car, the reality is that there's a good chance that she's going to have her shit smashed up and that officer is going to get revenge on her for having his ego damaged. 
uh, I went through the situation with Champaign police and U of I police and in less than 60 seconds, simply for asking them to identify themselves and asking why they pulled me over, they smashed my window and dragged me out of the car. They refused to identify themselves. They refused to tell me why they pulled me over. And even Chief Cobb agreed that the officers did a good job employing violence before using words. And the Alea Lewis incident, she received no explanation for why she was being attacked. And I didn't see any de-escalation there. Um, the reality is that police love to use violence. That's why they sign up apparently. And the other reality is that Schlosser seems to have no idea how local policing actually works. And that's why tonight's presentation was such a waste of time. Um, all Schlosser did today is show how police frequently escalate a situation from forgetting to pay a traffic ticket to throwing someone on the ground and charging them with additional crimes, Schlosser actually thinks this is a reasonable and sensible outcome. Um, what, what Schlosser said about, you know, someone possibly, you know, having a false arrest and then, oh, we'll get it taken care of at the station later, that is absolute horseshit. Once those cuffs go on and you are forcibly taken to jail, that innocent person is now damaged. They're damaged physically and they're damaged emotionally and they damn well be ready to get damaged financially. Uh, this isn't just some little chat. This is a destructive force in this person's life. The police are actually incentivized to charge an innocent person with a crime because if they can make something stick, then it will be nearly impossible for that person to sue the police in civil court later. Once those cuffs go on, they go to jail, some charges happen. Even if the charges are completely wrong, they better figure tens of thousands of dollars in costs to get the situation fixed and it's gonna haunt them for years and years. That's the reality. Schlosser never talks about accountability because there is no accountability. So the game we play is that Schlosser can show up and talk about how things might work and then cops can pretty much violate all those rules and no one will hold them accountable. And we see this all the time. In fact, we, we almost always see the police help cover up misconduct for their police buddies. Uh, so don't let Schlosser's sales pitch trick you into thinking that there are actually checks and balances in policing because there, there really aren't. Um, I don't think our I don't think Urbana residents want our CPRB to simply become indoctrinated with the police approach that we know has not been working. Uh, we have a civilian board so that we can have a non-institutionalized voice. And so far my impression is that this hasn't been working. Um, the CPRB as we have it, as well as the police review board in Champaign has had a broad failure to recognize corruption right in front of them. Uh, locally, we have our Mayor Marlin, our City Attorney James Simon, City Administrator Carol Mitten, Basilia Clark, Elizabeth, Elizabeth K. Meharry, the list goes on, Brian Serafin, all just, they're verified liars at this point, and it's been presented over and over on multiple occasions. These people have knowingly made false statements to the public and to city council members and board members, largely regarding police. And to the public, it's painfully clear that these people are working contrary to the interests of the public and entirely on their personal interest and in the interests of their friends. And this information has been brought to the CPRB repeatedly, but you just ignore it because I suppose it's, it's easier for you. And so going on to the beginning of the meeting, when uh, Ricardo was talking about people resigning from the CPRB, uh, and this has also happened to the CRS in Champaign, uh, the, when these people resign, they always cite time constraints as the reason. And, and what is missing in this explanation is the other side of the equation. It isn't worth the time because there's almost no chance of any good coming out of serving on a police review board because your hands are tied in every way. And if, if Mikhail thought his presence on the CPRB would really make a meaningful difference, I'm sure he would have stayed. Um, and and, and as, as an expression of this, I want to remind you guys that the CPRB does not even have full access to Urbana police use of force policies. You guys aren't even allowed to see the use of force policies. Have you considered how absurd that is? How are you supposed to do your job? How are you supposed to recommend changes? Uh, I think presentations like this are a huge waste of time. Let's actually get something meaningful done. The CPRB can set up a list of demands for change to the CPRB ordinance and to policies and present those to the city council at any time. Um, are you guys brave enough to do that? Or are you going to continue to sit back like you have for the past 13 years and let the established interest groups just feed you garbage? Thank Make you, Chris. Thank you for your contribution, your opinion. Um, we are, have taken today's time uh, as uh, training. We'll take your uh, uh, your points into consideration also as part of our training. Um, 
There are so many uh, things to cover and uh, points to make. So as we make notes and, and make our agendas, we, we will take everybody's viewpoints. Uh, we have two more uh, participants. Uh, Tracy is the first one on my list. And then Grace, I don't know who actually came on first. So it's OK. We'll just go with Tracy first. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, um, this is Tracy Chong I'm from Urbana. Um, it was just painful to hear Mr. Schloss's presentation today with him claiming how proud of um, how he trains the recruits at the Police Training Institute um, to hear him describing how impressed others are with his training. Um, in his presentation, Mr. Schlosser is just presenting this uh, rebranded version of the bad apples narrative. Um, again, instead of, oh, it's just a few bad cops, now it's, it's not happening in our town because our trainees are well-trained. Um, they know how to de-escalate. De we've got PowerPoint slides. We've got presentations on the five steps. It's not a problem here. Our trainees, they know how to respond accordingly. Um, his lists, like the anti-peace phrases, are such a joke. And him saying that the five steps are followed because of good training is also a joke. Um, this does not happen in reality. Residents have documented police officers using those phrases and even phrases like in the Leah Lewis case, uh, asking her to act like a lady. Um, I don't know how Mr. Schlosser does not see these things happening. Um, he also seems to trivialize how the um, resisting arrest charge has been used to justify police officers' actions anytime their ego is challenged by a civilian. The resisting arrest charge has been used as punishment and retaliation against anyone who questions the police um, is not polite or if they challenge the police officer's authority. This is something that police officers can just use at will if they don't like the person. Um, he was basically explaining how um, we've seen the situations escalate and um, kind of using it as an approval for escalation. And somehow, um, I guess, it, it was quite terrible to see that, um, to hear him say that this was not a problem and, and just explain the resisting arrest charge like it's something that is normal and can happen. Um, I'm not sure how in touch Mr. Schlosser is with the conduct of Urbana Police Department officers, Champaign Police Department officers, U of I police. Um, based on his comments, um, I don't know, I guess Mr. Schlosser is either so out of touch or he refuses to see the truth or he's just lying to promote the good image of the police. I guess I'm curious how presentations like this are supposed to help the board or the public when it just seems like a big community PR move. Um, I'm glad that you guys actually brought up the issue of what happens when the system fails, because it does fail and we've seen it fail and we've seen situations escalate, which happens all the time here in Urbana uh, Champaign. Um, and the answer cannot be that it just does not happen here or that when it happens, it is according to policy. Um, finally, uh, a comment from last uh, CPRB meeting when um, James Simon said that the public has no business bringing up FOIA issues to the board. Um, this, is, this is terrible for him to say that. It is in your mandate, it is in the ordinance that you can make recommendations and changes to city council. So I really urge you to um, dig deeper and address this issue if you do see problems and not let someone like James Simon tell you, oh, you guys don't touch this. Um, the public has no business bringing it up to you. That's just uh, completely untrue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chong. I think it's important that we hear uh, everyone's view uh, uh, about the training and about the contents. I think it betters us and to what to look for and to what to line up. Um, two things just for the public. We are, uh, when somebody doesn't follow uh, what is expected of police, I encourage people to put in a complaint and then to uh, go through the process of, of coming to appeal because that's when we, we get it. And I agree too that we have uh, the prerogative to uh, make recommendations to city council as to 
what rules we operate under and there's a, right now a list of things that we're working on for that. So um, we have Grace Wilkin next for comments. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Grace Wilkin. I'm a resident of Urbana and thank you for taking the time to go through this training and opening it to the public and listening to public input. Um, while this may seem like a nice presentation, I'm wondering what it means in the bigger picture of what actually happens when officers are on duty. Um, is there actually any tracking or data of how often these steps are followed? I think Katrina asked a great question with that. Um, and are there any consequences for skipping these steps? Um, it seems like there aren't, and the problem is that officers feel threatened in certain situations and not others, and that causes it to be an excuse to justify the use of force, and this happens all the time, like with Leah Lewis and many others. Uh, we need to address the deeply rooted racism and other biases in our society and police officers. Uh, the right to wrongfully arrest someone makes the police officers above the system of the law. Why do citizens have to obey the officers if they're not otherwise legally required to, like with no warrant or no other wrongful or in a wrongful arrest? In the training, I thought it was crazy that saying, if it feels good, don't say it. Um, that's assuming that officers will obviously only feel good about something that's inappropriate. The assumption that the officers will feel good at something that's antagonistic or harmful or, quote, wise, clever, or sarcastic, um, that just doesn't make any sense. Why would saying those things make someone feel good, especially when there's such a huge power differential? Um, I've worked as a teacher and with people with special needs, and sometimes they have been disobedient, rude, and even violent. And I've never thought such mean, terrible things about my students or clients. And I wouldn't feel good saying those things. Even in fast food work, I definitely would never use physical force to get them to comply. That's not how anyone else in any other profession handles things. Um, I've had to physically protect myself against a larger person in a raging tantrum, and it didn't involve hurting that other person. I understand some of the challenges to situations police are in, and I still don't think that the brutality is okay. I'm also wondering if all the officers go through this training on racial bias um, and how long that training is. I'm also wondering if there's any accountability, because um, this training may sound good, but there's still 80 some percent of child arrests in Urbana that are African American children. Um, the presenters also quoted saying that they might not be a bad person or um, just because they're being arrested, they might not be a bad person, but some might be. Um, that's just ridiculous. There's no bad people. And that just makes another excuse. They can say that someone was a criminal or a bad person and justify violence and murder. So I uh, appreciate you all taking the time to listen and wondering what roles you have, the, uh, what things you have within your power as a commission to address some of these issues. I know the appeals, um, but there's a lot of other wider issues and a lot of things that aren't spoken in the presentation we heard tonight. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Wilkin. Um, it looks like, yeah, Grace is our last person, uh, public input. Uh, so we'll close that off. Um, I'd like to ask uh, members of the board, if you see uh, from these comments, also things that we, we could do that we could take up. I think Tony's question about um, that he asked uh, Mike, I'm trying to find it back in my notes. Yeah, efficacy. Uh, are these things being done is the basic question, I think underlying your, your, what you said, Tony. I don't know if you're, if you're back yet. Um, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, because I, I do think that that's really, that's where the measurement is. Um, I know that we are, uh, uh, we have some constraints, but we, for us, especially during this period, it is a wish list of things that we can ask the council for. So I always view, ask after you've done your research and you know what you're asking for. So I don't know if, if we can turn that into uh, something that can be done uh as i mentioned to a couple of you right uh, before that the whole thing started rolling i i just believe that uh i i don't mind it when somebody double checks uh, on me not as i said before triangulating but also uh 
we have the net. We can do research on efficacy of training. We can do research on, uh, you know, these five steps. So anyway, that's, that's my first thought burst on that. Anybody else have some thoughts on it? On the presentation itself or the five steps or? Well, presentation too. Why not? Okay. Um, I always try to look at things on both sides. I know I'm new to the board um, in regards to what someone is bringing. Um, the, the scenario that, that we did, um, one of the things that I would have liked Mike to ask when I said there was a language barrier, how do, and I guess we can ask Kim, or I guess I could have asked him, I thought about it after the fact, was me saying no, no, no. And he said, we have lots of, um, language interpreters on at the U of I campus, but in that moment, you don't know what I'm saying. And in that moment, I'm a no, scared no. woman who do doesn't know the language. And all I usually am used to saying is no, you don't know why I'm driving or whatever. So how do you help me in the moment? By the time you help me, I have probably added up another charge because you've taken me out of my car and now I'm at the station. Um, also, when I when I ask the question in regards to, okay, um, and I hate that I think of stuff after the fact instead of in the moment because I'm we so, were all in that. We, but, the, but the fact of it is that if I go as a citizen, if I go to pay something at ten o'clock or three o'clock, it should immediately there should not be any. It should be immediately taken out of the system. There shouldn't be a police officer that still has my warrant on there anywhere in the documentation and I paid it. That's why I said if if you stop me and I have documentation, my receipt of payment and everything, hey, I forgot to pay this ticket, but here it is right here. Here's my receipt. My I have it right here. Number one, I got to go through all of these questions before I can either like reach in my purse or reach in my bag to show you this. But how is it there should not be a lapse from when I paid it to when it's out of the system? Like he shouldn't, stop, he shouldn't stop me because I had a warrant that was already paid. It should be all out. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be like a lapse. But I thought about that like after he got off the phone. Yeah. So, so those are things that, that would make um, a citizen really leery. I always try, because I drive a lot. I try not to drive that much at night by myself, but I try to take the same way. But I wouldn't say no, but I would be scared if, I, if you stop me just because of me being a woman. You know, I don't know what you're stopping me for. So it's just a lot of things that sometimes I wish some officers would. And I know that they are citizens, but they still are a policeman there and going through these scenarios. So I think it would be really, a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would be interesting to sit in on on his scenarios because I'm one of those people that I'll ask a question back to back. And if you're not ready for me asking questions back to back, it's going to throw you up. I think that's one yeah. of my that's a plus for yeah, me. Yeah, no, no, completely. Yeah. Katrina, two, two thoughts. One, um, I'd like for us as a group to channel, uh, to take what, the system has a lot of problems. We, we yes. know many of them, right? Yes. We need to pick out the ones that are ours, uh, you know, that we can influence, and then from there prioritize which, in, in, in what order do we take them? Uh, okay. So I, I, I want to pick out, you know, as, as you're talking about, you know, some of those may be the court or their computer system or whatever else, but in the end, it translates to a bad experience for, for whoever's being pulled over. Um, mm -hmm. The other one I thought is, um, when the presenter is presenting, uh, I, I, I can empathize. I, I, I do a lot of training, and I need to get through the point, and if I get too caught up on the details, you know, his... his uh, his little scenario was not rich enough for me to criticize because his point wasn't really to get through. He was illustrating his points. And so I said, I'll leave it for now. But I, I, five de-escalation wasn't enough for me. So I'm going to look at other models. Uh, and so, uh, but of course, right at that minute, I just couldn't look it up so I could say, what about this model? Right? Cause we're, we're living through the training. So, uh, I just like to take your situation that, as as you said, the language one, and say, so what is being done? 
because it's what he's training on, his limits on the time, and then what's actually going on. And we need to figure out ways to, to either uh, observe, are those good scenarios and those are the ones he's using and how real are they? Uh, so we have a chance to do that. We might not have a chance to uh, record police, but we do have recordings of police that we could probably get to, and especially when a case comes up, uh, to see whether they did it or not. Uh, but really, it's not whether they did it or not. You know, was the person treated fairly is, is the ultimate question, and I think that's within our prerogative. Um, so anyway, those things run through my mind because I, uh, we are going to have a lot. Of, we do have a lot of work to go through, but we got to pick our, our choices. And I need your help to, to line them up more than, than we're doing. You know, we did pick one of them for our regular meeting last time, and we're going to be work. We're, we're working on it uh, to improve even just a little document. But we are in the middle of the big questions that there's been a proposal and council has to consider and we have an influence on recommending that. So anyway, that's just a thought, um, a, a reaction to, to, to what you said. Uh, I take my notes, and but I, I'm barely systematizing into Excel sheet as to which ones, and then I'll share with you guys as to what, I'm, what I'm, I've been taking on, on these notes. That was on the presentation. Uh, well, actually on the five de-escalation things, you wanted to say something, Katrina, too? I got my son's mowing. Um, uh, when I asked about if there were statistics from someone going, because I, I have witnessed, number one, I've witnessed police officers not doing those steps. So it was good to know that there were some, some steps that they're supposed to do. But I think it would be nice if there was some statistical findings on those officers that as we all know, because you wouldn't get complaints, on someone skipping going from one to five instantaneously. I do. And, and it could be, you know, that person, you know, the police officer, there might be a history like, oh, I'm stopping this person yet again, or I'm encountering this person yet again, which does happen because you have um, citizens that continue to buck the system, continue to have ongoing constant police contact, but hopefully they look at each situation as different, even though, They've dealt with that person multiple times, mm -hmm. but it would be good to know if there's statistics, if someone has taken into account, hey, did you go through those five steps? And I know that he also stated that some officers um, come back to the to PTI to be retrained, but who makes that decision? Is it the officer says, hey, I need to be retrained? Is it their supervisor that says they need to be retrained? Is it the department, someone in the department thinks they need to be retrained. That is another question. Like how, how does a person, you know, who makes that ultimate decision on should they be retrained? So I, I really, I, I agree with you and, and think, so what's the list of questions of things we want to know and what data is being collected to answer those questions or what would need to be collected to be added to what they're collecting, right? So I'd like to set up a list and open it uh, for, for questions that people have on, on data and then see which of those is, is, is answerable already and which ones we feel strongly that need to be answered and institute whatever collection. And then which ones are, are, are beyond the present system's task. I, I, I keep thinking there are less than 30 patrol officers for Oliver Bannon. Uh, as I've learned, uh, when you think of 30 people filling all the shifts for one week, it just boggles me how it's done. And I know that an answerable thing would be, well, hire more officers to cover more hours. But wait a minute, we're talking about money and we're talking about more officers. That, that doesn't fit into our, our present picture. Uh, but then how many people are paid? That, that out of, you know, out of the police budget. That ought to be a question for me that I would want answered just to get a feel for it, not even to, to criticize it. I need to understand it, right? So anyway, those kind of questions, I think we ought to accumulate, put them forward. 
uh, if nothing else, to satisfy curiosity and then for us to press on which ones still need to be answered. Uh, if the data isn't there, if the personnel isn't there, there will be some that we would probably insist that ought to be answered and be made public, uh, regardless of the present constraints. You know, there's always going to be limits, but we need to we need to cover up. Uh, we need to cover as much as needs to be covered uh, from a citizen's perspective. Uh, so, or a resident's perspective. I like to use resident because not everybody, not every resident is a citizen. Uh, anyway. Uh, does anybody else have any other comments or uh, that, you know, we need to move to close today. Um, we still have our, 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 our public with us. So uh, under normal circumstances, I think we'd come back to the topic today is uh, this one in which we need to move on. We have a regular meeting on the 23rd. Somebody double check me. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we decided to do a monthly and that this one was a special one because it's training and we're all going through uh, all the trainings as stipulated by council. So, all right. If no other comments then, uh, please make a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Thank you, Scott. Second. Second. All right. Tony and Katrina want to second that. Let's get that done. Okay, um, I don't know if there's staff here to, uh, I hate closing a meeting by vote, but. I, I roll can, call, I right? Call roll call. call. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. Here. <laughs> Good. Okay, Tony Allegretti? Yes. Ricardo Diaz? Yes. Scott Dossett? Yes. Katrina Kendall? Yes. Daryl Price? Yes. All right, so we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, members and, and community members. Uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.